Alex. So, uh, and Mary again is the mom of Alex, and I think her story kind of says it all. So, whatever you guys. Okay. Um, so, um, my name is Mary, and this is my daughter Alex. Um, we, um, Alexandra has HD, and um, her dad. So, to start with, her dad was 27 with when he was diagnosed. Um, he is one of, um, let's see, 12, 12, and um, there's um, eight of them that have HD. So three, there was actually 11 of them. Three do not have HD. Um, mm -hmm. And when he was 27, he was diagnosed. He um, um, deteriorated rather quickly in a sense, um, and he had to be moved up to Tewksbury to be taken care of. Uh, probably by um, his early 30s, and he passed away at 42. Yeah. So Alexandra, who um, yeah. I have two daughters, one um, is um, yeah. at risk. She is 32, and she does not yeah. want to get tested or anything. Um, the <laughs> other one um, is Alex, and she is 30. Um, she was diagnosed at age 23, yeah. um, so that was early for HD. Um, yeah. Her father's 27, so it seems like it go it does go younger, um, depending on the family member. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'll just tell her what I'm trying to do is just kind of give her insight of yeah. what how her day is or what she does basically and what mm -hmm. HD has been to her. Mm -hmm. um, when she is a college graduate, actually, she has a teaching degree. Um, and she was working with autistic students um, and at age 23, she was diagnosed. So she was, um, had trouble walking and we could see her speech a little bit. Um, so we found Dr. Frank, who is at Tewksbury Hospital also with BI and um, went to see him and got a formal diagnosis. Um, so um, about six months after that is when she had to uh, kind of stop working. She couldn't, I mean, working with autistic kids, she couldn't handle them because she was having trouble standing up herself. Yeah. And so um, she went on disability at age 23. So, um, you know, that was, that was hard, I think, for her because her passion was always to be a school teacher. And it just didn't, I mean, from the day she was five years old, I think she always wanted to be a teacher. So... Um, and so 23, not working, did some volunteer work, uh, yeah. but then eventually she couldn't even do that. She just, um, trouble with, um, like I said, walking, speaking, um, not your typical 23 year old. She's had, um, it's been hard for her because, um, you know, while most of her friends are going out and, um, you know, enjoying their mid twenties and uh, with friends and drinking and stuff and partying or whatever they do. I mean, she can't, she can't do that. She's at home with us. Um, she um, has slowly um, need help walking. She needs help dressing, showering um, and her speech um, is a lot of slurred. I mean, hard to understand, but it takes her longer to process what somebody's saying and for her to get those words out. So if she does speak it, yeah. it you'll notice that yeah. she, it has to, it takes a lot for her to say what she is thinking. Yeah. Um, so um, she, and her dad, like I said, her dad passed away and he only has one sibling that's still left. The other ones have all passed away um, yeah. over, the, yeah. over the years. Um, she struggles with being exhausted. The movements make her extremely tired. We have tried a lot of different um, uh, uh, vitamins and things to help her with energy, but I'm not sure if that helps with the with her body moving so much. Uh, it's just exhausting and for her to get dressed. I mean, if she does, she does get dressed yeah. some days by herself, some days she needs help, but yeah. just getting dressed and she puts on her own makeup. Yeah. So for, for her to do that, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, just to do that part 
yeah. when she's done, she's just even more mm -hmm. tired. I think that's why today she was like exhausted for a nap because she really did. She got up this morning, she got dressed by herself and she put on makeup and right there, I mean, that's like, you know, right there just takes so much out of, we don't realize how much it takes out of someone with HD than a normal person. <laughs> Um, to do so she does probably take uh, at least an hour to two hour naps every other day maybe two or three you know probably three out of the seven four out of the seven days a week um, we were lucky enough to get her into a day program that she goes through now so she's she is home most days uh, with COVID obviously we haven't gone anywhere um, but she does have a day program we found this wonderful program um, in um, in Eastern Mass that she goes two days a week. So she goes, at least she gets out. Um, and with other people age, age probably 18 to like 35. Uh, it was very hard to find a place for someone with a disability who's in their 20s. Um, most places are adult day programs. So, so she was home for a long time before we actually got in this place. Um, so she struggles with that. Being home with us, not having friends before the program because how, how is she going to get places? She cannot drive. She hasn't driven since she was diagnosed. Um, you know, so she doesn't do much on her own. Do you want to say anything? Tell me about yourself. What you're passionate about. Hmm? I love to teach. She loved to teach. Yeah, I want to be a mother. Yeah, being a mother is, um, yeah, she has a hard time with that. Um, struggling to, um, struggling to not have children. Like I said, she's always wanted to have children. So this here is, um, is probably one of the hardest things for her to, yeah. to accept. Yeah. Uh, Alex, I have to just say that I, I I know it's not the teaching you wanted to do, but you've done this for us a few yeah. times by teaching people about Huntington's yeah. disease and do you work for the walk and, and in other places. And you did an awesome job on your makeup. You look great. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You're right. I do. I, I have told her that before. Yeah. And I said to her, you know, you may not be teaching students, yeah. but you're reaching a, a lot more people in this world about HD yeah. right. by, by just going out there. She has a, she's had a blog. She really hasn't blogged in a while because uh, I think as she progressed, it, it just hasn't happened, but she has a blog that she had out there that she was telling people. She actually wrote a book called Living with Passion, and it's on Amazon, actually, um, when she first got diagnosed and how, um, how, that, how being diagnosed and how when her dad had HD and how she dealt with first got diagnosed. It's, it's a paperback book out there, but it is on Amazon, and she has sold quite a few quite a few um, auditions of it, um, public, you know, promoting it and stuff when she first was diagnosed and how dealing with accepting it and, and um, you know, what her life was like at that time. Um, so, um, so that's what I tell her. She's reaching more people, even though she's not teaching young students. This is, this is more, more apt to what she's doing. And people, I, I just want to say, I mean, between the, um, the, the movements that you're seeing and in her um you know walking and stuff there's a lot of um outburst and things um that happen um you know you or i maybe we can open a jar no issues with her she struggles she can't turn her hands she can't do that um luckily nowadays they do have more medications so she takes a lot of medications to help with her anxiety her depression uh her outbursts more than there was years and years ago um, before um, they diagnosed the gene, you know, determined where the gene was and stuff. Her, her dad um, had a ton of outbursts and would throw things and hit things. And that wasn't, we actually had left. There wasn't a good environment to raise two uh, small children in. So um, I have to do say that with the uh, medication and the, and the new things that they have out there for HD, um, 
that it has helped over the years. Um, kind of even out some of this um, tempers and things. Definitely. You have anything else you want to say? No. Um, it's, it's hard. I think with someone like this, what do you do? What, what can we do? There's not a lot we can do. We take her places and things, but we, we, if we do like a whole day or something, the next day she's, she just, you know, needs to rest all day. So it's not like to take a trip or to even just do two or three things in a row, days in a row. It just, you can't do it. So it's changed our whole life. We look at things different. We think of different things to do with her because we can't leave her alone. Um, we do, she's, she needs someone here all the time between um, the off balance when she walks down the hall, she probably hits one side of the hall or, or the other, at least, I mean, every time she does because otherwise she'll be tripping or falling. Um, so when we do go long-term places, we do have to use a wheelchair for her because um, it, she just can't walk that far. It's just too exhausting on her. How about, um, how is, uh, what about, um, Diet and food. Are you having trouble swallowing, Alexis? Yeah. yeah, all her food, she is having trouble swallowing. We've had swallow tests and stuff, but we have to actually cut all her food up into like little pieces or, um, you know, we make sure it's like we have mashed potatoes. You know, we try to think of things like mashed potatoes, scrambled eggs. I mean, other than that, like if it's chicken, it has to be really, really cut small. Um, small pieces they, they don't know people they see they don't know like how to stop putting food in their mouth so it's hard for her to to say okay i have too much in my mouth i gotta chew it she's having she can't chew correctly because of the swallowing issues her teeth grind a lot so she has trouble swallowing so you have to make it so small and give her small portions so that she doesn't put everything in her mouth and then she chokes on it going down and it sometimes if she eats too too much too fast, it doesn't go further than here, and she ends up choking and spitting a lot of stuff up. Um, so that has been um, an issue over the last uh, year or so. If she's, I mean, she's thirty, and she's you know obviously gone downhill since she's was twenty seven. Um, besides the swallowing and the walking, she talks with her teeth like together. Um, doesn't, you know, you have to say open your mouth and that's hard for her to do. She can't leave her tongue out. Um, so. So I'm imagining that it's been hard with, to get a dentist to or, you know, for that. For that yeah, one. I mean, we have to, I mean, unfortunately we haven't been to one in a while. We just yeah. said we need to schedule an appointment. But um, luckily she nice. does have a cousin who is a dental hygienist. So. Oh. Um, we haven't, we have to get back to her. She's had moved practices. So we have to get back because it is hard to, um, she's the only one she's been to. And I think now it's been about a year or so. She's progressed so much that she hasn't opened her mouth. Like we brush her teeth mostly for her. She just like washing hands. Like you have to go in there because she just like, the mind doesn't know. Like she thinks, okay, I'm, you know, it's just. Yeah, the organizational. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's hard. Like I said, we do. She needs help showering, bathing, washing the hair. These are things she just can't do on her own anymore. Because she would just go and think she's done. You know. What else do you have to say, Alex? Do you want to do you want to say anything about the walk? I I meant to pull up a photo. I didn't have time of uh, we have Alex. Nice little video. Um, her amazing Boston Walk team did last year. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. With COVID, we couldn't do the walk at Castle Island like we normally do. And I I'm one of seven, so I have uh, six brothers and sisters. And Alexandra has um, 29 first cousins. Yeah. So uh, between them and their spouses, and there now they all have kids. So she has about almost 30. Um, second cousins I guess if that's what you call them or nieces whatever um so we we did a walk in our in our neighborhood right around our sub uh our subdivision we had um all my brothers and sisters and the, and the kids came and my uh brother has a 
uh, a drone. So yeah. he actually uh, had the drone up in the sky while we walked around the blocks. Yeah. It was really cool. And then he put it to music. So it was yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, we try to, we do go to the walk every year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we also, also going to convention. Oh, she likes going to convention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's a virtual. We have a national convention here. Uh, it's, and, and, and you're part of the National Youth Alliance, right? Yeah. Yes, but now that she reached age 30, oh. you, you're become an alumni of the NYA. You can't gotcha. participate. Oh. So um, okay. she, um, they, the NYA is um, a National Youth Alliance, which is part of the HDESA yeah. for anyone under 30. 30 and it basically it's awesome at convention they have like a two-day thing just for these young ones so that they can talk about hd some of them have parents with hd other ones are i mean they're all at risk some have it and some don't um so there was a big when she first got diagnosis it was really good to go because she met a lot of people that she's in touch with now uh through facebook and everything and just to help deal with you know everyday things when she's feeling down I mean you know it's not an easy thing to do deal with and people always say oh my god you're so strong or she's so strong but I'm not I'm not strong she's strong I'm not strong she's the strong one I mean not many people I think her age you know can can do this with you know she's a fighter and and dignity and and uh, i mean don't get me wrong she has her moments when she hates it cries like why me you know but but we try to put in perspective the good the good and the bad right so what positive things do we have in our life as opposed to the negative and in our situation we have a huge support family here between my husband and my extended family um and so right there and the hg society right there if we didn't have that if we had to do this alone it, it, yeah. it'd even be harder i think they should grandfather her in as my <laughs> okay, i'm gonna advocate that. <laughs> i know i know no but now they do kind of have alumni day there too now they kind of because i think over the years there's so many that were in that for so many years, now they reach 30 and they're like, yeah. you know, they're still dealing with the same issues that they right. were before, even more probably being at that age. And and if you're at risk, a lot of them, I mean, some do get uh, tested. Like I do have an older daughter, like I said, who's at risk and she, um, she just does not want to get tested. She doesn't, you know, she just wants to live her life in, 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 in to the fullest and, and she is. and. But there's others who have got tested who are positive, and now they're dealing with this. They may not have yeah. symptomatic symptoms like Alexandra, but they're still dealing with the what ifs. So well, what could happen? You know, know. How, how how when is it going to hit me, or right. how how am I going right. to be? Yeah. You know, and we have a local we have a local youth day here as well, um, and then there's the national youth alliance that they're speaking of. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I'll just uh, I'll slip in here and there from some of my things, but. The testing, because I know people ask this a lot. So someone is one with the new gene for Huntington. Um, we encourage people not to get tested until they're an adult, because it, it's a challenging decision. But is there anything else you guys want to talk about or that we should know? You are on mute right now. Okay. Yep. Do you have anything else to say before we no, hang up? No. So you can go now. She was just about to take a nap and I said, oh, okay. oh let's go, sir. So um, no, okay. because I, I think it's good that people see, you know, um, experience HD. You know, like I said, there's a lot of people that don't know about it. So another hard part just to mm -hmm. say before we get off is people will see us people don't understand what's wrong with her. You know, obviously they don't understand HD. A lot of times they may think she's drunk. I mean, we've been places like, say like a St. Patrick's Day, we went out to dinner one night and she was off like this, you know, moving and stuff. And we did get looks and, you know, and, you know, she has trouble eating. I mean, we take her everywhere. We do not not take her places just because of her disease. I I don't see that, you know, I'm her mom, maybe it's because I'm mom. I don't see that part of her. This is my daughter. That's who I see and I love. 
But you, you can look at other people and see the way they're looking at you. And I, and I can show people like, oh, look at her eat over there. She's drunk. But yeah. so I guess we just like need, want to yeah. get the word out. And, you know, it, and that's why we're raising awareness for HD, just so people can see what it is and see what kind of disability it is. It's not, you know, um, it's hard, but that, that's the, sometimes it does get to you. And, you know, um, one time when she bumped into a table, the person gave me the dirtiest look, but my oldest afterwards went over to that table and said, you know, but you just gotta let it roll off your shoulders. You can't let it get to you. This is who I worry about. I don't care what other people say or see. Right, right. I mean, she has to be able to live her life and you're educating people at the same time because you know, they, that person might later say, oh my goodness, I have to think twice before I make a judgment like that. Yep, yep, yep. And, and we, you know what, we, I've learned that too. I mean, you know, just dealing with this, you know, not that we make judgment or we say, but you sometimes you probably used to think things, but now you never know. You don't know what's up with somebody or what their issues are, what their problems are. So you can't speak without knowing, you know, Yeah. so. All right, you good? Well, we appreciate you yeah. letting us speak today, oh, and uh, yeah, you know. I'm grateful that you did. I really appreciate it. We hope we see you June nineteenth. We're trying to get to Castle Island, so stay tuned. Oh, do we think we're going to be able to do it in person? We do. That's our goal. If it has to be hybrid, it will. So yeah. um, stay tuned. I'm going to get you that. Well, well, we go for our second shot on Monday, so if we're very positive about that's that. Cool. We're happy that we were able to to do that. So. Yeah. That's a, that's a plus too yeah. for her. Yeah. So. All, right. All right, nice seeing you. Thank, Thank you so much. You so much. Bye -bye. All right, bye. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Okay. So, did you want me to just go right into my uh, presentation, Christina? Yeah, I think we can open it up if anyone has any immediate questions, you know, about Mary and Alex's story, Ooh. and then Virginia will take over and you know, talk through yeah. some slides. Yeah. Um, so I'll open it up if anyone has any questions about um, about Mary and Alex um, or what they've experienced. Yeah, my name's Joan. You mentioned that um, she had juvenile onset. So I guess it, when I think of juvenile, I'm thinking younger. So is juvenile for you like under 30 or what? Yes. Um, so... Uh, in, in my slides, I'm going to talk about that this is generally a midlife onset disease, ages 30s to 50. So it, it's never something, I mean, there are some elderly people that just start to get the gene. Um, but for the juveniles, um, and there are people who have gotten it when they're two and five, but um, we do see a lot of teens and late teens and a few like, um, you know, Alexis, that it might be 2021. Um, and we do consider that juvenile because the likelihood is that the symptoms showed there, but that the beginning of the destruction of the nerve cells started um, probably, you know, at age 17, 18. And what also happens is it's a much faster progression. So sadly, you know, at, a, at, at her age, um, you know, she's probably... She's going to get go down very rapidly, um, so it it's sometimes faster. Oftentimes, the younger the age of the onset, the faster the progression of the disease. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Anyone else? I know it's it's a tough thing to see. <laughs> And if you think of Mary's situation, I mean, she's saying she's not strong, but you know, someone like this, this is what happens is, you know, she, she went through the caregiving of her husband who was only 27 and now turns around and has a child um, to care for. And that's not uncommon. It's, it's not as common to have juvenile HD, but it is common that then your child in their thirties <clears throat> or forties perhaps then become symptomatic. Do you know if, this is Joan again, sorry if other people have yeah, questions, no. but do you know, um, so Mary mentioned that her husband was one of eight that mm -hmm. all had, right, 11 of the eight, eight of the 11, right. sorry, yeah. had. Right. So is, 
does it tend to be more of a genetic disease and like what did his family have yeah, it? it is so in my slides i'm going to go over that it okay. is a genetic disease um <clears throat> and um every child of a parent with huntington's has a 50 50 chance of inheriting the disease so that's why you can see how much this can devastate families it's not you know, 50% of the family gets it. It's a 50-50 for each child. So unfortunately, in, in her family, um, you can see that this was a situation where the coin toss, you know, just wasn't great for, for so many of the children. Um, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna, and so someone just added about cognitive impairment in the chat room. And again, I'm, I'm gonna cover that in my slides. So, um, so maybe what I might do, Christine, if it's okay with you, is stop the slides and, and either open it up to questions in the end or as I go along. That sounds great. Thanks, Virginia. Okay. Uh, let me pull that up. And I'm um, going to, um, hang on, I want to uh, share my screen. So, um, um let's see share screen okay <laughs> there we go all right let me know um if you can see this yes we can okay so again I'm just going to try to um give you an overview of Huntington's disease and what our organization does um, this is, as she, um, as Christina mentioned, the Northeast region is four. We have four regions of the Huntington's Disease Society. We are part of this one national nonprofit organization whose headquarters are in New York City, the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And later, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of um, who we are and what we do for families impacted by Huntington's disease. Um, so, um, as I said, this is an inherited neurological disorder. There are very, very, very few cases of just an impromptu, no family history, spontaneous um, disease in some, someone. It happens, um, it's incredibly rare. It's usually traced back um, it, to a family member. Uh, and so sometimes, again, if someone's adopted, you find out that, guess what? Yes, it, it was the biological parent that had um, the disease. So um, again, it's a mutation of a gene. There's a mistake in the DNA code, code causing the expansion of CAG repeats. And I don't want to take too much time to get into the science. Um, uh, you work at Charles River Labs, you're probably all aware that, you know, we are made up of the language of CATG. And um, everyone has the Huntington's gene in them. We all have a, that gene um, and, and it's a protein that we, we know we can't live without. But for the folks that have the mutated gene, um, there's just an expansion of the CAG repeats. Um, and that is hence the cause of the cell damage. It's an autosomal dominant gene which means that every child of an affected parent does have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the disease. It's progressive and it is fatal at this time. And we'll talk a little about that later about um, the research and how we hope it won't be fatal. Um, it causes changes in thoughts, changes in emotions, and changes in movement. And I'll go into detail on that in a minute. It is considered a rare disease. So in America, there's about 41,000 people that have it, but 200,000 more people at risk. And as we know very well um, at HDSA, um, it affects many more people because as you can see, there's siblings that have a, a, a you know, someone that has Huntington's, there's children that have a parent that's Huntington's and a, a you know, a, a caregiver is a mother or father who, um, is caregiving for um, a spouse and then children. So it really does impact the whole family. The age of onset, and so this is what I'm mentioning earlier, begins in midlife, 30s to 50s. 
Um, and again, very few cases, no, not very few, but less and less if you saw scale. As you get older, you're more out of the ward. So if, if I had HD in my family, if I tested, if I didn't take the test and I'm in my 60s, there's more of a chance I probably escaped the fate of Huntington's. But unless I get the test, that's not a definite because it can strike in later ages. Um, the other thing that um, I should mention is that, um, you know, Alex stated that her dad had HD. There is very much a tendency, if you inherit it, it from the father, that you will get it probably younger than the father, and many of the juvenile cases are from a father. None of this is exact. You can't say this is how it's going to be, but the trend is there. Whereas if you get it from your mother, you tend to get it roughly at the same age mom started to become symptomatic. Um, does So for non-juvenile cases, there's a progression of over a 10 to 20 year period. We start with the very mild symptoms in the beginning when we're looking at this 10 to 10, 20 year period, um, which again, progress all the way until um, death. Um, juvenile HD is the exception, as I mentioned earlier, with an earlier age of onset and faster progression. Um, sometimes too, the juvenile HD, they have um, some, especially the younger, or even younger than um, Alex, more of almost a Parkinsonian rigid-like movement disorder than you see with some of the flailing movement of um, an adult with HD. Um, but there is a progressive breakdown of the nerve cells in the brain, which causes slow loss of physical and mental ability. As more and more brain cells die, the symptoms increase, eventually leading to someone totally unable to eat, to speak, or swallow. There are personality changes anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, impaired judgment, people get an unsteady gait and eventually are unable to walk. They have involuntary movements, the movements she was speaking about and the slurred speech. Those are what leads to what she described for so many of our poor people where they are um, identified as being intoxicated. They get arrested by the police. Um, and so we try to do a lot of education even to our local police stations. Um, and, and, and as you see, um, in my last comment on this slide is personality changes and emotional symptoms vary among individuals. But all people with HD share the same eventual decline in physical abilities. The reason I wrote that is that it, it seems there's more variation with people um, with HD as to how irritable they get and whether indeed um, they get um, their impulse control um, issues from the changes in the brain um, lead to a, a more aggressive, you know, a more aggressive in nature. Um, so the variance is, you know, we have people that absolutely, um, have so much anxiety, um, they need medications, and it's an ongoing struggle even with the medications. There's a lot of perseverance when they want something, they want it immediately. And if they don't get it immediately, you know, they may get physical. They become somebody that, you know, that caregiver said they never were. This is not who they were in the past. Um, and then we have people that they, they don't, that doesn't happen. They do slowly physically progress. Um, there's a little bit of changes, but basically um, you don't have that same extent of the emotional changes. There's, uh, there are actually some people who do develop a psychosis with some um, schizoaffective um, symptoms and, and of course absolutely need medications for that. And so that, you know, again, all of this, the good news is there's a lot better medications these days for people with me mental health um, issues. And so there's not a pill for Huntington's. We're just taking pills from other um, issues with mental health and giving that to people with Huntington's if, it, if, if that's what they need. Same with depression. There is a higher suicide rate among people with Huntington's disease. Um, but again, um, now we've got better antidepressants and the more education we do, 
so that neurologists um, and, and clinicians realize that um, it's not just that they are sad about having the disease, it's chemical changes in the brain. It's a major effect of depression. Therefore, they need the big guns, right? They need um, an, an antidepressant. Um, and um, we already spoke about the, the progression, the loss of speech and difficulty swallowing. Um, it does get to a point where in the end stages, people get, um, they need to make a decision about having a G2 or not. Um, that's one of the advanced directives they need to be looking at. So, um, and, the, and, the, and the other thing is organizational skills are, in, uh, are um, declining cognitive skills. So if it, somebody um, has a job that requires them to you know, use their brain a lot, whether they were an accountant, um, then sometimes the job loss is, is not caused because they can't walk anymore because they're still walking fine. It's that they can't organize thoughts anymore. She talked about Allie brushing her teeth. Well, you know, if you ever sat down and thought about how many steps it takes to get in the shower, take a shower, wash your hair, brush your teeth, um, put your lotion on and get dressed, you do it quickly, right? Especially when you're late for work. If you wrote down the steps involved, there's a lot of steps. And as your organizational skills decline, that becomes a very big challenge. So I'm talking kind of quickly because I want to, you know, make sure I cover anything. Does anyone have any questions thus far? Okay. Um, so as we say, until there is a cure, there is care. Um, that is our um, philosophy at the Huntington's Disease Society. So what do we have for care at this point? Um, Sadly, there is no cure. I can tell you that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was not a lot of knowledge on the type of medications that can help. There was not a lot of clinicians that had a clue about this disease. We get horror stories from calls from people back in the day and what they were told, you know, phone calls saying, you have this awful fatal disease, there's nothing we can do for you. Um, so there are medications, as I said, for depression and anxiety. And even though there's no medications to slow the progression of the disease yet, um, there is amazing um, work being done in labs across the country and companies across the country that are working on, and some of them are in the stage three clinical trials where it has shown to, um, absolutely slow the progression of the disease. And they're in human clinical trials. So these are, um, have come about really in just in the past few years. Um, so the hope is that, that within the next, you know, three to five years, maybe longer, but hopefully not, um, we will have something that will have that person who may have been symptomatic in their 30s or 40s not become symptomatic until their 70s or 80s. And as you can imagine, that's a game changer. And it also allows time for our scientists who are all working so hard and working so quickly um, at such an amazing pace to come up with the absolute holy grail, which would be a cure, right? So um, we, our families have a lot more hope than ever before. There's um, so many more biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies now involved in this. And the list has just um, grown so much in just a very short amount of time. Um, there is um, a few medications, just a couple out there that do help with the movements. They, they, they help, um, again, none of these stop the disease and they don't slow the progression. But um, for people who, who that, that movement disorder, those involuntary movements are so severe, sometimes it can be helpful for them um, so that they can have a little bit better quality of life. Diet to prevent choking and increase caloric in, um, happens with Huntington's diseases 
your metabolism is impaired. And what happens is, yes, of course you burn calories from those involuntary movements, which are all your limbs. Um, however, there's also um, impairment to your metabolism so that you're burning calories at a phenomenal weight. And so you need to give these folks increased caloric intake. And yet, as you heard earlier, you know, the diet because of choking, you have, you know, is you have to be creative with what you give them. So you talk to a dietitian or a nutritionist, um, you know, some people are at the point where they're just going to be doing fraps, you know, liquid things. And, um, but there's a lot you can do before that. But the main thing is, you know, you've got to increase those, those calories. Um, and, and also they can become very warm. You know, I used to work at a facility with uh, a lot of people with hunting disease and, you know, we'd be uh, middle of the winter and people were like, nope, I'm wearing my shorts and my t-shirt today. Thank you. Um, there are exercises to strengthen and help prevent falls mm -hmm. and improve coordination. So, um, you know, Alex is a little, you know, further along, but, it, you know, earlier on into mid stage, um, there are in our centers of excellence clinics, physical therapists know them and we get brochures out on that. There are exercises one can do to uh, help prevent falls, to strengthen and help with coordination. Um, so again, these are just things we do so that, um, you know, we hope to not, you know, so, so, ex so symptoms are not exacerbated and to keep them as safe as long as possible. Adaptive equipment, you know, the special broder chairs, because some of these people that have really severe movement disorders, they're going to tip a regular wheelchair right over. Um, and so they're going to get, uh, you know, bed sores in the bed. So there's padding, but the broder chairs are very strong chairs. They're impossible to tip over and they've got lots of padding. Um, you know, utensils for eating, weighted utensils, because again, if you've got that issue with the movement and just coordination, so um, we have those. Um, educating caregivers on how to communicate with patients. This is so important. So the thing that's different from Huntington's than from Alzheimer's is this. Most of the patients know what is going on until the end of the disease. So they may have trouble articulating because the speech is gone and they may have trouble processing what you're saying because it's processing slower and they may have trouble responding because it comes out slower because the pathway to the brain, it's like there's a detour, but they do get there. And so what does that mean? That means that we have to educate nursing home staff and family caregivers that when that patient doesn't answer you right away, um, you need to wait. It's not that they're demented and didn't understand what you're saying. It's not that they're depressed and don't want to answer you. They're taking longer to process what you ask them and to process their reply. And this has prevented so many issues when we can educate caregivers on that fact. Um, so there's things like that. There's, things, there's a, a lot of other things that we educate caregivers on with regards to communication. They try to not have a lot of excess stimuli, which can be confusing when you have issues in the brain. So if you are trying to keep them calm, if you're trying to have a conversation, if you can do it in a quiet setting and, and again, don't shoot a bunch of questions of them all at once. Our HDSA Center of Excellence Clinics, we now have 54 across the country. We started at 20 only, oh gosh, I, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years ago. So that's pretty phenomenal because what happens at the clinics is, as you can already see, this is a disease where, um, you know, it's complicated. There's so many symptoms and they can go to a clinic where everyone there it has an expertise in Huntington's, the physical therapist, the social worker, the genetic counselor, the neurologist. Um, and um, they also will 
help to educate um, professionals and family caregivers, as well as our HDSA social workers, as I said, they'll go out to nursing homes and other places to educate the staff, because it's really challenging if they just have one patient with Huntington's disease. It's hard enough that they're usually 20, 30 years younger than the rest of the population, but um, they've never seen <coughs> these symptoms. And so that can be really helpful. And the other thing our centers of excellence do is they, they screen people that want to be in clinical trials. Um, and we're really proud of the fact that um, so many of our brave HD family members from the community have signed up for our clinical trials. Um, that sometimes can be an issue with some diseases. So that's really helped um, to get these clinical trials um, come to the um, place that they they are. And um, so we also have a clinical trial finder on our website so people can see what's in my area and what kind of people are eligible for this trial. So uh, before I talk about the Huntington's Disease Society of America, does anyone have any questions? I threw a lot at you about the symptoms the incidence of Huntington's or anything like that. Virginia, I think we have a few questions that were in the chat. Uh, someone asked oh. us, um, some of the cognitive difficulties, is this because different parts of the brain are eventually affected um, in terms of some of the symptoms? And I, I have to apologize. I think when I'm looking at my PowerPoint, I don't see the chat mm -hmm. for some reason. So if you can read the rest of them, that's great. But yes, so um yes the cognitive changes affect the personality um for some it depends on as i said the person you know maybe how much of the the cell death was in that area of the brain them it it, it affects the emotions and it affects the the um cognitive decline and again, all these things, whether it's the physical movements, whether it's um, some of the cognitive decline, you know, it starts out slowly. Um, it's maybe not as obvious. So just like the, the physical movements originally might initially may look like someone who's just a little nervous. They had maybe a little bit too much coffee to drink. And so, you know, they're moving their fingers a lot, but you know, and it'll progress and progress to the point where there's these large flailing movements and the cognitive same thing. Again, originally it's just, um, you know, things that we all do, right? Like, oh, wait, where did I put my coffee cup? Where did, what, what, is, um, what was that thing my boss told me to do? Um, and then that will progress. So does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one is because Huntington's disease is caused by extra repeats of one small section of the chromosome four, is there a way to inhibit extra production through drugs? Um, is that something that's being worked on? Right, so again, it, so one thing you can do is you can go to the hdsa.org to hdbuzz and they have updates and great free just all kinds of articles and webinars that you can download on the many different um, trials that are happening. And so, yes, that is included as well. And a lot of, so a lot of what people are targeting now um, is with messenger RNA and tricking, tricking the system into not um, continuing to create more of the mutated protein because um, that mutated protein is basically clogging up, right? It's clogging up the the brain cells and and uh, the brain and the and the pathways, and that's um, and hence the issue. So, um, not being a scientist and not wanting to get you know say the wrong thing, I can tell you that yes, that's one of the many things they're doing. But if you want the details on the specifics of the different trials to go to hdsa.org and hdbuzz especially um for anyone who's um you know more of a lay person than a scientist as well as those who are um already uh researchers you'll find a lot of great information there 
Is there any other chat questions? The last one is, does deep brain stimulation help with the movement symptoms like in Parkinson's? I'm going to say that I don't know the answer to that, but um, I again know that some of the trials, actually in stage three, are for an infusion in the brain as well as one that's in the spinal cord. Um, but again, my understanding is that is generally for slowing down the progression of the disease in general. So in a, in a sense, I would say, yes, it's not specifically for the movement disorder. Um, I think that I know that for some people, I know they've worked with Botox and a few things, but again, um, I'm not gonna make the mistake of pretending I know more than I do in that, in that arena. So again, I strongly encourage you to go to hdsa.org to hdbuzz and, and you can find a wealth of information. Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, I think you can uh, move on to these last couple slides. Okay, great, thank you. So um, I work for the Huntington's Disease Society of America as mentioned, and um, this is a nonprofit, national nonprofit, and it was founded by legendary folk singer Woody Guthrie's wife, Marjorie Guthrie in 1967. Um, Woody Guthrie, uh, does anyone know what probably his most famous song was. And I know that you're probably all very young and say, who is Woody Guthrie, right? Um, the answer is this land is your land. And uh, Maj so Woody Guthrie, um, he was a political activist. He was a songwriter and his wife, Marjorie Guthrie was a dancer in New York and in the, it, it, a ballet dancer and um, it was sort of an unlikely pair, but at any rate, Woody lost his battle at age 55 and he was um, in a state hospital in New York and Marjorie was frustrated by the lack of knowledge about the disease and um, made it her business to um, educate and advocate um, so that other families wouldn't um, have those same issues. She um, basically started the Huntington's Society of America um, from her kitchen in New York City by placing an ad in the New York Times. And again, 54 years, years later now, we have 54 chapters and affiliates um, across the country. We have 54 centers of excellence. And again, they have a genetic counselor, social worker, a multidisciplinary team and screen for trials. We have a disability rights attorney and she is um, wonderful because as you can imagine, um, people with this disease who may lose their job because they still are able to walk and talk and they look fine are having all these cognitive issues. And so it's very important. Um, people often will get denied, even though they have this horrible fatal disease, disability. And so she's very helpful in what they need to know from the start when they're applying and if they get denied what to do. And, you know, that's obviously, there's no charge for her services. So uh, families have, have found her to be incredibly helpful. We have social worker support groups and a helpline and telehealth. So even in the virtual times, we did not cut back on any of our mission and our social workers have been busier than ever. So a lot of our support groups moved to virtual, but they go out, they educate, um, you know, these agencies, these nursing homes, daycares, jails, anywhere someone with Huntington's is, we will be there. Um, the telehealth has been great for people that otherwise maybe can't get to um, a therapist. And um, so that's been very helppful in, in certain areas of the country. Um, it's, it's accessible to anyone in the country, but it's helpful for those who don't live near places. The clinical trial finder is on our website. So I mentioned that already. People can go and find a trial near them. Um, funding to research is we, um, we have uh, several programs to fund young scientists um, and others to do HD research. And as mentioned earlier, um, the results from research for HD in general are just 
really exciting these days. Um, so I'm, I think I already kind of covered the research updates and, and again, encouraged you to go to hdsa.org. Um, I, I can't say enough though that this is really a, a, a you know unprecedented time for families that, that you can understand how tough this disease is. And in the past, we were able to say, we're working towards a cure, um, hang in there. <laughs> um, and now we can tell them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel coming soon. And that that's a game changer. Um, we do advocacy at the state and local level for the Parity Act. The Parity Act, we got part of it passed, which is so that people with Huntington's, um, if they apply um, for um, disability, they have their um, application expedited because it can take a long time. And we did pass that. Um, and now what we're working on is that then they don't have to wait two years to get Medicare so that they, they have that as well. So we do a lot of advocacy on that. And we're hoping this might be the year that we make that happen. National Youth Alliance, I guess we already touched on that. Um, and again, just a great thing. We have a, a local thing here, but nationally it's just everyone getting together and saying, oh, I don't have to explain why my mother has movements. I don't know explain what it's like to be at risk because I am surrounded in a room full of people um, that get it. And um, local education days, we go out, we um, have education days for our family caregivers. And um, we have a national convention. Um, it was in Boston in 2019, just days of, you know, 1,200, 1,300 people getting together and um, getting the latest information on HD. Some of them, it's their first time. They was recently diagnosed in the family. And some people, this is what they do and they've done it for many years. And it's just like one big family reunion. It's, it's incredible. Um, I already mentioned we do the outreach to nursing homes. And we have free publications on any topic of HD. So someone can go to our website and if they're looking for... Um, how to find a nursing home, how to, what do you need to know about genetic counseling? What do you need about uh, swallowing and diet? Um, you name it, we have it. Um, and I also um, want to say that we have hundreds of events that we host annually. We have many locally. You guys are here in Boston. You know, that walk is June 19th at Castle Island. Love to see you join Allie's team. Um, if anybody is interested in volunteering, we are always looking for board members. Our board members are not just HD family members. So if you have, you know, been, if you have a daughter or son that's uh, fresh out of college and it is looking to, um, you know, get involved and learn more, they, they will learn a lot about working as a committee and working for an organization. Um, it's a great way to give back. Um, so again, we have four area walks. My celebration of Hope Gala is a murder mystery, and that's in Newton, Mass. In July, we have a curling event for anybody that is interested in curling, and um, we also have a lot of virtual events um, that we've been doing, and like many nonprofits over the past year, and we're going to keep doing those as they tend to be popular. Um, so uh, again, our goal: we help families struggling with Huntington's disease. And as you can see, we provide help for today and hope for tomorrow. So if you want to volunteer for an event or apply to join the board, um, my information is below. And um, I guess in a nutshell, that's what HDSA is and what HD is. Um, we are volunteer driven, so we welcome any help. So if you want to have any questions, I know I covered a lot in a short amount of time. Well, thank you so much, Virginia. This was really, really informative and, and very helpful. Um, I really appreciated all of the information and hearing Mary and Alex's story was, was very powerful. Um, and I will share these slides afterwards with everyone if that's okay, so they can have this information. Yeah. Um, and if they're interested in getting more involved, can, uh, yeah. can do so. Yes, so. absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, Everyone, let's hope we all can gather again soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much.